GolfTrips.com show, we're going to interview golf travel writer Mike May as he takes us on the journey to Kent County, England. Well, welcome to the show, Mike. Uh, you and I have uh, played a lot of golf together, and uh, I know recently, well, in the last few years, you uh, took a uh, travel, uh, some travel, golf travels to uh, Kent, England. And I would just love to know, you know, how you got there. And I know uh, as far as featuring your articles on GolfTrips.com, it's absolutely fantastic, and I enjoy those reads. Well, Brian, thank you for the chance to be on the show. Uh, why England? Why Kent? Well, I think it goes back to um, the fact that my dad was English uh, and our family lived in England for four years from 77 to 81. I was age 15 to 19. And that's really where I developed my interest in golf. And so when I started becoming a golf writer and wanted to write about various parts of the world, uh, it quickly became clear that Scotland and Ireland get lots of attention. And so maybe I can uh, show some respect uh, to my family lineage and write about golf in England. And it's been a great surprise. And I was invited to go to Kent in 2018 after going to England's Atlantic Links in 2017. And um, what I found both uh, in the Atlantic Links and in Kent specifically was amazing. Sure. Why should a golf, a golfer or a traveling golfer um, put Kent on their bucket list? Well, I think there's no other county in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, that has three open caliber courses in its realm. I'm, of course, referring to Royal St. George's that will be hosting the British Open or the Open Championship next summer. It was canceled uh, for summer 2020. You've also got Royal Sank Courts, Sank, C-I-N-Q-U-E, which hosted the Open twice in 1909 and 1920, and then Prince's that hosted the Open in 1932, won by Gene Sarazen. So they're all very close together. And then there's another course down the road called Littlestone that's an open qualifier that makes for a, a great four-course destination for a buddy's trip. Oh, uh, outstanding. So as far as, you know, building out an itinerary, is there a recommended number of days of going? Um, is this a 36-hole type of destination? Are people doing replays? Or is it 18 holes and... Um, spending time in, in exploring the culture and, and the city? I think it's easily a week-long trip. Uh, if you can make it two, great. I played eight courses in Kent, so there's more than just the four that we're focusing on today. But also what's great about Kent is that there's probably more to do that's exciting for everyone that has nothing to do with golf as there's the golf. So if you bring along a spouse, he or she will be as entertained as you will be uh, and in fact, you may enjoy the non-golf as much as you do the golf. That's why Kent, which is actually very accessible to London, uh, it's the best weather. It's, uh, again, a short drive from the two London airports. And the uh, the food and drink in that part of the world is is tremendous. Yeah, what I'd like to do is actually bring up a map and just kind of show our listeners and our viewers where we are in the world. Um, so maybe you can just give us a, a quick overview of, uh, you know, where Kent is. Right. Uh, London is actually in the very southeastern part of England, and actually Kent is southeast of London. And uh, you either fly into Heathrow, which is on the western edge of London, or into Gatwick, which is sort of south London. And from Heathrow, it's about a two-hour drive to Sandwich, which is the, the, the destination for a trip that we're talking about today. And it's about an hour and a half to hour and three quarters from Gatwick uh, over to Sandwich, which is actually in the far eastern edge, southeastern part of, of England. If you go any farther east, you'll jump into the English Channel. Sure. Uh, Mike, share with us how big this region is. Um, and I believe, you know, sometimes you refer to it as Kent. Sometimes you refer to it as uh, Kent County. So how big is this region? Well, again, uh, Kent is a county. And England as a whole uh, is about the size of Indiana. And Kent is a rather large county, probably the equivalent of two or three American counties. It's quite large, but uh, easily accessible, uh, north, east, south, west, wherever you want to go. And um, again, it's, there's far fewer English counties in England. There are counties in American states. So I'd say Kent is probably 
again, two to three times as big as an American county. Sure. Well, let's jump into some golf. We got the ge- uh, the ge- geography uh, lesson out of the way here. Uh, maybe just walk through the notable courses uh, and why they should be played. Well, let's uh, begin with the, the crown jewel of Kent, which is Royal St. George's. Uh, it was designed to be the St. Andrews of the South. And once you go there, you'll realize it's got a special appeal to it. Uh, it was the first course outside of Scotland to host the Open Championship. And next summer, it'll be the 15th time that the Claret Jug will be contested uh, there at the St. George's, Royal St. George's, which is also nicknamed Sandwich in honor of the town that it's nearby. So when you hear Sandwich, it's not always a reference to the village. It's often a reference to the golf course. And they're right next to uh, Royal St. George's, uh, separated by a metal fence, is Prince's, which is a 27-hole venue. Again, it hosted the Open in 1932. Uh, just a few miles away is Royal Sank Port, C-I-N-Q-U-E, and we'll explain later why it's called Sank. And then just down the road, about 45 minutes from Royal Sank Port, is Littlestone, which is an open qualifying site. Sure. Well, let's uh, let's chat just a little bit about uh, uh, princes because um, when 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 we've talked and I did a little Google search, I was looking for princesses instead of prince plurals or plin, uh, possessive. You tell me where what does the apostrophe mean and and any history behind that? If you look at the logo, it's P R I N C E S, but every other reference to it is P R I N C apostrophe S, and I believe it's connected to the original ownership group. Uh, which were, I think, a set of brothers. Their last name was was Prince. Uh, right now, Prince's is a 27-hole venue. Each uh, of the nine holes has a name. You've got the Himalayas. You have the Shore and the Dunes. Obviously, there's sand dunes all over this place. The Shore, because it's right next to the, uh, the English Channel, and Himalayas, because there's some rather large mounding um, and some large bunkers on the course. It's changed a lot since the days of Gene Sarazen, but it's um, a wonderful venue. It's actually one of the few uh, of the four courses that I mentioned. It's really the only one that you can use a traditional American golf cart, though over there most people do walk. And if they don't want to carry their bag, they put it on a pull cart. But over there, they call the pull cart the trolley. And the golf cart is called a buggy. So make sure you get your terminology right. Sure. Well, we just talked about Prince Prince. Princes? Princes, not princesses. Not so princes. princes. So the one that's, uh, you know, really uh, will throw you not for a tongue twister, but will throw you for, well, maybe a visual um, uh, curveball is Royal St. Ports. Uh, sank is in the boat sinking, but when you look at it, it is definitely a French word. Yes, uh, sank in French stands for five. And it's a reference to the five medieval ports, all in Kent, uh, that actually served as a home, I believe, for the um, the British Navy or the British Maritime Services. But it was a form of uh, defense from any uh, invaders from from Europe. Uh, over time, silt has actually sort of clouded up some of those harbors. So of the original five, only Dover uh, is actually a, a fully functioning port. And Deal, which is where Royal Sank Ports is located, uh, is actually one of these, what they call a limb or an extension of the five ports. So there's a little uh, history connection there. Again, Royal Sank Ports hosted the Open in 1909, won by uh, J.H. Taylor in 1920 by George Duncan. In my opinion, you could put the Open there today. They just don't have the infrastructure and the roadways to get big crowds of people in there. It is as good a test of Lynx golf as you'll find anywhere in the world. Sure. You mentioned um, uh, about four courses and, you know, are there additional golf courses you can play? And of the ones you mentioned, which one's the hidden gem? I'd say the hidden gem is the fourth course we mentioned uh, earlier, Littlestone. It's about a 45 minute drive from Royal Sank Ports. It is an open qualifying site and it is called the Championship Links. Uh, nothing more needs to be said. It is everything and then some. The easiest hole in the course is probably the 295 yard first hole, which is always played into the wind. It's not an easy four, even though in the paper it looks that way. That it's a delightful stroll. Many of the holes border the English Channel. Uh, there's no threat of actually the ball going in the channel, so don't worry about that. But 
if I were to blindfold you and put you in the middle of Littlestone, and I said, Brian, where are you? You would go, Scotland, Ireland? I'd say, no, we're in Kent at Littlestone, and we're uh, a place that looks just like you would expect on TV. Sure. So when I travel with a bunch of friends, I'm the golf nut. And some of them are foodies and are there for adult beverages. If we were going to, you know, eat and drink like a local or brag to our friends when we got back that we had their signature dish or their signature drink, what are we eating and drinking in Kent? Well, when it comes to beverages, uh, the oldest brewery in England or Great Britain is actually called Shepherd Neem. Uh, I've actually taken a tour and done the taste testing afterwards. I can guarantee that the beverages are to a high standard. So you've got the oldest brewery in Great Britain, uh, and they use hops that are grown right there in Kent. Kent, by the way, is known as the Garden of England. Uh, nearly 50% of all the fruits and vegetables consumed in England or Great Britain come from Kent. Uh, lots of apples and, pe and pears and strawberries. In fact, the strawberries and cream that you see served at Wimbledon every year, though not this year, come from Kent. Uh, Kent is well known for lamb. Lots of sheep are grown and uh, eaten there in Kent. Uh, the uh, Dover sole, for those seafood lovers who've had Dover sole, well, Dover, Dover from Kent. So they have a lot of great, uh, they also have a winery, the Chapel Winery. So beer, wine, vegetables, fruit, all comes from Kent. So everything you eat is pretty much uh, locally grown and harvested and produced. It's uh, spectacular. Sure. So, Mike, I'm a Midwesterner, born and bred, and when I watch shows on England, there's always tea time. Um, t what, it, what is tea time? How does an American that may have not experienced that, uh, what's the experience? What should they be doing? What's some do's and don'ts uh, for tea time? Well, it's optional. Uh, many people have tea in the morning, as I do. I'm a big hot tea drinker. Over there, you don't need to say hot tea. You just say tea because it all comes hot. There's no iced tea. But uh, many people have a morning tea break around 10, 1030. It's a cup of tea with a little bit of milk, a little bit of sugar, and maybe a digestive cracker, which is like a graham cracker. And then in the afternoon, there's afternoon tea. It's optional uh, around 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. Uh, if you really want to make it snazzy, uh, people what they call, call high tea or cream tea. They'll bring in sandwiches and little cakes and uh, muffins and some strawberry jam and, and some clotted cream. And they make it a big deal. Again, it's optional. Uh, make sure you're hungry. And, um, and then actually many people refer to dinner as tea time. So the word tea is used a lot. Sometimes it's just in a normal vernacular. It's time to eat dinner. Um, over here, we say breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Over there, they say breakfast, lunch, and tea. tea and so they're always drinking tea, and it's pretty good. Got, gotcha. So you mentioned, you know, kind of how large the county is or, you know, twice the size of an American county. Is this a destination where you're going to kind of pick one um, resort or hotel for lodging and stay? And any recommendations on where you would, um, well seek refuge or, or uh, set up your tent, if you will, uh, for the week? Uh, if you're going to follow what we're talking about today, which is to play Royal St. George's, St. Ports, Princes, and Littlestone, your best bet is to stay at a place called the Lodge at Princes. It was uh, built a few years ago. It's a 38-room lodge that overlooks the English Channel and actually is on the piece of property that overlooks Royal St. George's to one side and Princes on the other. Uh, it's designed for golfers. It has a first-class restaurant for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, a great bar. And then adding to the golf flavor, there's a fantastic, well-maintained and manicured putting green next to the Lodge of Princes. So either at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, you can work on your short game, uh, practice a few of those three-foot putts that you uh, want to make on the course. Again, you can begin the morning walking along the beach, looking at the English Channel. On a clear day, you can see France. Uh, there's no better location for a golfer to stay at the Lodge of Princes. And I'm sure when the Open's held at St. George's, all the officials of the RNA stay at the Lodge of Princes. I would. Sure. So when I do travel, on occasion I travel with my wife. She is not a golfer, but she allows me to play golf either late in the afternoon or in the morning when she's doing something else. For the non-golfer, what else is there to do in Kent? Or if you're just playing um, 18 holes, what are some of the other sights and sounds that people can take in? Again, I think that's the 
the appeal of Kent is as appealing to the non-golfer as it is the golfer. There's lots of history in Kent, beginning with the oldest cathedral in Great Britain, Canterbury Cathedral. It's less than an hour's drive from Sandwich. Uh, you also have some world-class beaches uh, where they do uh, flying kites, surfing, long walks along the beach, such as uh, uh, Botany Cliffs. You can also see the, the uh, White Cliffs of Dover, which became famous during the Second World War when the pilots were coming back to Britain from a bombing raid in Europe. If they saw those White Cliffs of Dover, they weren't far from landing. Uh, there's also tremendous castles. I think there's more castles in Kent than any other English county. Uh, I actually stayed and visited at Hever Castle that has a world-class gardens. Uh, I played the Leed Castle Golf Club, which is another course. It's a nine-hole course that overlooks Leeds Castle. Uh, it, Leeds Castle is a 900-year-old castle. Uh, Hever Castle was built in 1270. Uh, there's also Dover Castle. And um, I, uh, you, you would be well served going to the medieval town of Sandwich, which is not far from where you're staying at the Lodge of Princes. Uh, there's also a winery, the Chapel Winery. So between the beaches and a visit to the oldest um, brewery, you can also, if you're into racing, You've got the Brands Hatch, Brands Hatch Racetrack, which is used for Formula and racing, is there in Kent. So if you're into beer and wine and motor racing and the beaches and castles and cathedrals and a historic pub like the Georgian Dragon in the Sandwich, it opened in 1446. So lots of history that you can see, touch and try in addition to this world-class golf. Sure. Well, you had me at Sandwich, and when I did a little show prep, um, went on to the History Channel and learned that the Sandwich, at least what we know it as today, is uh, was formally introduced or invented, if you will, uh, in the region of Kent. And uh, as the legend goes, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, uh, John Montague, uh, was a, a notorious gambler and during during one of his um, long card playing um, runs, uh, he ordered uh, the cook to get him a meal that he didn't have to get up for. And uh, the cook uh, came back with uh, two large pieces of bread and uh, the fixings and meat in the middle. And uh, as legend has it, uh, the sandwich was born in sandwich and was commonly referred to that concoction around uh, the southeast uh, England as well as London. So um, there you have it, a little a fun little tidbit uh, for our listeners whether that's true or not and i don't dispute it but why let the uh you know the a story get in the way why let truth get in the way of a good story hey, I think it's, um it's, it's, uh, i've heard the similar story and i believe it hey I, I read it on the internet so it has to be true it has, so, to, be true. It has to be true so um mike as far as when to travel to kent um is there a high season and a low season um, when would you want to go there for uh, the best weather and when would you might want to go uh, there when you can get some uh, really good rates? Well, the good rates and still decent weather are in the shoulder season in the spring and in the fall, or they call it the autumn. Uh, March and April are good shoulder seasons, especially as you get into April and you can get some decent days. It's the driest part of Britain, so your chances of rain are less in Kent than anywhere else. And then you've got the uh, October, November in the fall. Uh, which are tremendous times to go. You definitely get a better bang for your buck, and chances are pretty good you'll get your golf in. Other than that, if you go in May, June, July, August, September, that's fine. I would avoid August and the latter part of July because that's when uh, the school children are on holiday taking vacations, so the roads will be crowded. I went in June. The weather was spectacular. Um, I've been to England in May, tremendous September. There's a lot of uh, a big professional golf tournament was held in England in September. So uh, May, June, September are best. You need to save a few bucks and have it less crowded. I'd go in April or October. Sure. One of the biggest questions I hear golfers talk about when um, a golfer talks about their European travels is transportation. And, you know, I'd like to think that they drive on the wrong side of the road. My guess is they think we drive on the wrong side or incorrect side of the road. But maybe tell me about your journeys. Uh, did you rent a car? Did you take public, uh, public transportation? And maybe put uh, some people's minds at ease on transportation in and around um, England as well as Kent. 
Well, England has some great public transportation, specifically the trains and the buses. But when it comes to um, a group of golfers, you probably need to have access to either a driver or a car. Uh, the big issue with driving in England isn't so much you're driving on the left side of the road, but you actually are driving. Your steering column is on the right side of the car. We drive with the left, and which means you're pushing the um, the clutch with your left foot and then changing gears with your left hand. So to bring some simplicity to experience, spend a few extra bucks and get an automatic. Uh, though I drove a stick shift and I'm okay with that. I uh-huh. learned how to drive over there. But it's um, just don't rush it and uh, Think before you move and um, and you'll be fine. Sure. So if somebody's sold on coming to Kent and playing golf, um, where can they get some golf package information? Um, who's providing that? Or is this something that they can put together themselves? I think a, a good place to start is to do your internet research. And uh, for tourists in general, you can go to visitkent.co.uk. And then for golfers looking for specific information on golf courses, go to golfandkent.co.uk. Uh, I do know that there's a, a number of travel agencies out there, uh, one of which is called uh, countrywidegolfholidays.com. Uh, you can check them out. I think there's some uh, opportunities out of Scotland that also provide uh, opportunities throughout England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Sure. Yeah, at golftrips.com, we work with uh, the experienced St. Andrews, uh, and they put together – largely packages for the St. Andrews, um, Scotland area, but they do do packaging throughout uh, Europe as well as um, England and Kent. And I know they were putting together a package for Royal St. George's for the upcoming Open. So uh, for those that are looking to come to the area, you know, those are two examples or two packagers that can uh, put together, you know, a, a fantastic experience, you know, for you or them. Um, I did also notice that Princess Princess had um, package information on their website. So some of the lodging, um, especially the one we just mentioned, you know, may have uh, some package information as well. Um, As far as flying into, once again, the best bet would be London, correct? Yes, there's two major airports, Heathrow, uh, which most people fly into. It's on the western edge of the city. And then there's another uh, international destination, uh, Gatwick, G-A-T-W-I-C-K. Again, he throws about a two-hour drive to Sandwich, uh, a little bit less for Gatwick. Uh, it is worth noting when it comes to Royal St. Andrew, uh, to a Royal St. George's, uh, they do not allow outside play in the month of August. I don't know why, uh, but they do allow outside play in the other months of the year. Not on the weekends, uh, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The only time that four buddies can play would be on Tuesdays, and they call that a four ball. So four balls are allowed on Tuesdays. The other days of the week, it's either got to be a two ball uh, or it can be foursomes, and that would be four people playing together but with just two balls, alternate shot. That's just one of the traditions of, of a Royal St. George's. So if you're a group of guys, it's got to be on a Tuesday that they play at Royal St. George's, and I highly recommend a caddy. They know all the uh, nuances. I had a caddy, and they tell you where to hit it and where not to hit it. Listen to them. They, they're experts in that course. Once again, we are joined with golf travel writer Mike May. We're going to wrap this up, Mike. Uh, we're going to end with where golfers and travelers can get more information. But is there anything we miss? Is there anything else you want to share uh, in regards to either your experience or uh, best practices for researching and booking a trip to the Kent area? I think it's important to realize that there is much to do outside of golf as it will be within golf. I wouldn't play have a 36 hole day. Uh, there's so much to do and see. Uh, do 18, do other things that'll make the trip just totally complete and also very uh, enticing for non-golfers. Well, Mike, I can't thank you enough, and I'm going to just leave um, our listeners and viewers this, that if you are looking for a guide, something to print out, uh, that we are featuring a booklet that you put together that talks and about many of the courses and the to-dos and destinations and lodging that we just chatted about, but it's something you can print 
show your foursome, eight some, you know, your 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 golfing buddies, uh, as well as you know maybe uh, other couples or spouses if you're looking to travel uh, with uh, with spouses. So once again, uh, rattle off the two websites uh, that we can go to get more information, and then I'm going to leave everybody with where they can find your guide. Yes, yeah, so visit Kent dot co dot uk or golf and kent dot co dot uk everything you'll need and then some sure and once again you can find mike may's articles and booklet on golftrips.com under the uh, kent destination area or you can surf over to englandgolfer.com and find that booklet as well thanks a lot mike it's a pleasure thank you